Finishers MMA, finishersmma.com, at finishers. That's how you find them on social media. These guys have a show with us every Monday called Now We Go. You can check it out. Zach, JM, Thor, Grace, there's too many to name that come out of that school, and they are killers in the game. They are the biggest MMA jiu-jitsu school in the area, and they are owning the East Coast. You can contact them at 610-438-0746. Ask for Andrew. They are at 3761 Nicholas Street in Easton, PA. They have two locations as of now, Bethlehem and Allentown. They are growing into three, four, five, six. They, I would say they are taking over, but they already have check them out on all their social media they are awesome to follow and if you're looking to get in shape you're looking to choke people you're looking to do anything at all to better your life finishersmma.com Ball, ballyrooter.net. That's not how you pronounce it all the time. I just say it that way. All Valley Rooter, Jared LaBarba. He is my plumber. He's the show's plumber. I'm getting him plumbing business all over, and I love that he is getting what he wants. He has 24-hour emergency service. He is certified, insured, and professional. You can follow him at All Valley Rooter. He's on social media, and you can find his information at allvalleyrooter.net. Jared came down over the weekend and he fixed a problem down here he's super professional i love him as a person i love his business he grew it and uh he's doing his own thing um it's allvalleyrooter.net it's 24-hour professional plumbing services he can help you out with everything you need it's 610-762-1656 he's certified insured and professional do not be afraid to contact him for any of your plumbing needs support jared jared supports us luke delmeyer handmade custom knives uh I love Luke. It's LukeDelmeyer.com. He's a farrier, a bladesmith, and a blacksmith. He has custom knives, and the best part about it is you can take classes to make them. So not only can you take a class to learn how to make knives, at the end of the class, you get that knife. We're working on a project together. He started uh, recently getting into chef knives, so he started to make chef knives. He makes hunting knives. He can make any of your needs as far as blacksmithing. That's at Luke Delmeyer on Instagram. That is the best way to follow him. You can see all the stuff that he's Posting, he shares, he does raffles, he gives giveaways. Check out all things Luke Delmeyer at lukedelmeyer.com. We've had him on the show before. You can dig down in the library, listen to how he got started and where he's at now. I'm excited to work with Luke. Uh, he's a really good friend of the show, and I'm excited to showcase his chef knife that he's making me. Check out all things Luke Delmeyer at lukedelmeyer.com. Farrier, bladesmith, blacksmith. We will integrate, and then it's a part of each other. But that's not—that's not, not going to happen in a year. It's not even going to happen in a year and a half. So, no, like, you no. can get business off of it, like with the ad reads. But what you essentially want is to melt together. And then, like, me learning that has brought me to just wanting to do that with, like, finding. Now I have to find the right people to work with. But that's it's like it's, like, it's just growing. Thing. It's that's just the growing. hardest thing to, to find the right people to really surround yourself with that are, are going to help not only help you elevate, but just help you grow with your business and the things you're looking to, you know, take advantage of. You you need to have those right people around you in order to really grow. And it, that's why the crew around you is key, because if you have those weak links or you have yeah. those people that are cancers and, you know, they're, they're just negative and they bring you down, it, it's just going to be something where you're not able to grow and you're limiting yourself. So the people you surround yourself with is, is so key, man. It's so crucial. And it's crazy. People say that, um, we'll just do a rolling star. Uh, usually I do a clap thing, but we're already talking. It's all good. Um, usually when people say that you don't realize it until you see it work, we're yes. like, Oh, like how we were talking earlier. I'm like, I'm so grateful for having JM and fr- Zach in front of me because I always see what they're doing and I'm like, all right, cool. Well, it's, it's, you know, you, you have a format in front of you. You have somebody taking a risk in front of you, you know, like I hope to never catch up to them because I know they're not going to stop, but you always have never a mentor. You always have somebody in front of you that's doing big things Yes, and it's important to have people around that. I mean, there's a lot of people that told me, uh, you know, leaving the post office was a bad idea. Coming and doing this full time, they didn't yeah, know. It's not and it's like when you when you start it's not feeling, security. yeah, when you start feeling, feeling. I don't want people like that telling me no, 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 no. I want either. people being like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's fucking get it. <laughs> let's, like, go. let's go after. Yeah, it. like now we go. <laughs> That's now what Zach said go. as soon as I posted the key. Definitely. 
Um, when did you get into boxing? When did you get into mixed martial arts? Um, I want to go through the whole story of yeah. just how this started and then how you got connected with finishers because I see what you're doing over there um, with kickboxing and boxing program yeah. and everything. So uh, where did all this start? My God. Um, it started from a childhood. Uh, my father, you know, he instilled uh, like uh, Jeet Kune Do. He was a big Bruce Lee philosopher. And uh, he really was big on me, you know, with training. And he started implementing things at home. I was six years old. I was a young kid at home. And uh, he was just showing me things, and he just brought me into, like, his training thing that he was doing, and I just fell in love with it. Did you watch the movies with him? Oh, my God, yeah. That's how I started. <laughs> yeah, I started yeah. watching Bruce Lee, dude. Bruce Lee was the fucking shit. Bruce yeah. Lee was God to me. Yeah. Like, I looked up to him, and I thought he was the greatest thing ever. And uh, then when I started learning, like, what he really was about, it wasn't just the movies anymore. Then my dad was introducing me to the philosophy and the yeah. books and really yeah, understanding the mindset. Yeah, my brother picked up the books. He the, went outside. I saw him go outside the movies and get into the books. Yeah, so when you start getting, like, philosoph like philosophical uh when you start thinking deep as far as what a fighter is and beyond the lifestyle of a, of an average person to be a fighter like what it takes like you just got to really dig deep and once i got involved with that it just it was like a love thing for me man it was just i connected with it i just expressed myself i was a shy quiet kid i wasn't like this you know tough like strong kid all the time i was always the smallest kid in the room so it was like with having this type of like martial arts mindset, it helped me grow and be the person I wanted to be. So I fell in love at a young at a young age, and then uh, what's it called? I um, as much as I wanted to compete at a, at a young age, I got into an accident. I got hit by a car. So when I got hit by a car at nine years old, it was something where I fractured my skull. They were telling me I shouldn't be in contact sports anymore. So I didn't get to compete like JM and these guys at a young age. I didn't have that. I had yeah. no amateur experience. I was basically a person that was just athletic and tough, and I took it on. So when I took it on later on in my life, it kind of just fell into my lap. How long was the recovery from the car accident? So, so when I got hit by a car, I was nine years old. It was probably a few months, but they told me like I shouldn't be in any contact sports within a year. So it took me a couple months to recover. But that sucks. You're right at the age where you start playing baseball, football, all that stuff. I was in it all. Like, I, was, I loved it all. So I was in martial arts. I was in boxing, karate. Like, I was doing everything. And I was getting ready to play football. And then, boom, this happened. And then uh, I took about a year, a year and a half off. And then from there, I went into it. I started playing football. I started doing the regular things kids do. And, uh, yeah. Did I they want your restrictions longer than a year? Yeah, they, they were telling me, honestly, they were telling me I shouldn't be doing it anymore. They told me I shouldn't be involved with contact sports. They should, I, I should be really limiting my contact sports, me, the head trauma I received by having a fractured skull. They were telling me I shouldn't be doing this anymore. Um, basically, that's what they were telling me. I shouldn't be doing any type of contact sports. But they were trying to tell me, you know, a year would be okay, maybe two years. But really, they were telling me I shouldn't be doing it anymore. That's tough, too, because uh, that's got to be tough for your parents to be like, you know, when you have an active kid like that, and then, you know, what are you supposed to do? My mom didn't give a shit. You know, my, keep, my mom, keep, my mom them, <laughs> keep them out of the, you know what I mean? Like you're taking yeah. childhood away from somebody, yeah. especially if they want to be active like my that. My dad, my dad, it hit my dad hard because my dad was like, uh, my dad's Mexican. He was an old school, like tough, hard nosed uh, Mexican. And my mom was like a, the softer Italian. So she loved and cared. She never wanted me to be hurt. I was, I was the baby boy. I'm the yeah. baby boy of two sisters. So I'm the youngest. And uh, she always looked out for me. I'm a mama's boy, so she looked out for me. And my dad always wanted me to do it. So it didn't affect her. It affected him because he always saw me as like, I guess he lived through me. Yeah. He, he wanted Because my dad was never a real fighter. My dad was a street fighter. He was known as this tough guy in the streets. Everybody didn't mess with him. Like, he was known as that guy. You don't fuck with Ricardo. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so he was that guy. And uh, he always... I could tell he wanted to live through me. He wanted me to be that person. And it wasn't, I didn't become a fighter because of that. A lot of people think, oh, well, maybe you did this because of your dad. No, I, I personally fell in love with this. He showed it to me and I took off with it. So yeah, man, it started at a very young age. And then I had the long span until I was an adult. Because like I said, I, I was doing other things. I went to college. I wasn't, I never thought of being a fighter. I'm, I'll be real. Like, People look at me as like this tough, like hard nose, like, cause the way I fought, I was a tough person, but I really wasn't that guy. Like I was this like soft, like 
kind of like uh to myself like i almost felt like introvert like i was like a shy kid and uh I didn't like confrontation. I still, honestly, I still don't like confrontation. Yeah, yeah. I still don't. <laughs> like, I I avoid it by all means. But if we had to, I'm going to switch. I'm going to turn that switch and I'm going to fuck you up. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, I really don't like it, right? So for me to become a fighter, it was so, it was so interesting and intriguing how it just fell into my lap. It literally fell into my lap. Um, I was getting a, a pro fighter, um, a local guy, George Gleekis. He, uh, he was getting ready for one. And I started training with him. He brought me in to train with him because he knew like I was like this tough striker kid. And he was like, "Yeah, he's like, come." Were in you and... training before that? No, honestly, I was yeah. just I was just doing some basic training like on my own. I was going to gym, just working out. Like I was doing things in preparation to be like a fighter, but I wasn't doing the right things. I had no coach. I wasn't no gyms. I was basically doing it on my own. And then they, I ran into them, and they were like, hey, come train with George. He's going to get ready for a fight. He's going to bring you in. He's going to help you with your wrestling, your jujitsu. And I, they wanted me to help him with, like, his striking. They wanted me to be, like, his striking partner. So when they brought me in, I was, like, a couple weeks. And they were like, you want to fight? And I was like, yeah, why the fuck not? <laughs> why the fuck not? And then I took the fight, and uh, on, like, a couple weeks of training, I fucking trained in Fredo. You know Fredo, right? I don't know if you know Wilfredo from the gym at all. It does the plumbing and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I literally trained in his living room. We uh we trained the guillotine in his living room, probably like hours on in. I had rug burn on my knees, like <laughs> I, I just go I'm just as I'm going back right now and yeah. reflecting, I'm fucking laughing because the shit I did to get ready for my first fight was just like unheard of. Oh yeah. And uh I won the fight by guillotine. The fucking guy didn't want to strike with me. He took me down. He fell on my guard. Boom. Guillotine was there. And I won the first round. And that's how my career took off. What was that like? Oh, my God. It was... It was... The, honestly, man, I think it's why I miss fighting so much. It's the... Uh, it's the most high. It's the most exhilarating high you can kind of get without doing drugs. Um, I, I've, I've, what I compare it to is like Friday Night Lights. Like when when athletes play football and... The lights are on them and the fans are watching, your family's watching. It's the same feeling to that, but it's just you. There's no there's no linebacker to help you get a tackle. There's no offensive lineman to help block for you. It's just you going out there. So for me to go out there and be successful, oh man, there was no feeling like it, man. There's no feeling like it. So yeah, it was it was unreal, man. To win the fight the way I did in the first round. That had to be crazy. It was nuts. I was I was representing a boxing gym. I was representing <laughs> yeah. Allentown Boxing Gym, dude. <laughs> yeah. Later, like this fucking guy doesn't know any grappling. He don't know jujitsu, but he. So their plan was probably like if if you you're, you're having trouble with the striking, just take him to the ground. Just take him to the ground. And yeah. then he took him to the ground. He took and it to you the, had that yeah. living room guillotine. Little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're damn right. I had that living room guillotine <laughs> on smash, and I fucking had it on lock. So when he got got in my guard, I. I fucking cranked the shit out of his fucking neck. Arm, it was. I don't think it was an arm and guillotine. I think it was just a, a neck. Who did you have uh, in your corner with you? It was Fredo. It was yeah. Fredo and my boxing coach. Did he flip out? Oh, he fucking went nuts. <laughs> he went completely nuts. He picked me up and everything. Like, oh, I'm sure. If we, if we go back and we, if I have the pictures I could bring up, you can see he's picking me up. Yeah. There's videos on YouTube of my first fight too, where he picking me up and shit. Yeah, it was. That had to be surreal. It was to un, win that way. It was unreal, bro. It was unreal. I was just. That's what made me just fall in love with the sport of MMA because I'm like, I'm a fucking guy that doesn't really know anything about jiu-jitsu or wrestling. I never wrestled in high school. I never wrestled a day in my life. And um, for me to have the ability to be able to go and learn it that fast and be successful and to get the reaction of people like buying into me, like my first fight, you know, my I never fought in my life. I think I sold anywhere from like 50 to 100 tickets. My fucking first amateur fight, I never fought in my life. So to have like the support and like the way to I pulled it off on that like short notice, it was just unreal, bro. Unreal. Where did you go from there? Because I'm sure yeah. you completely have the bug by then. Yeah. So then so now I are you hooked. like, you know, what's your plan? Do you do you look at it as if that's what you want to do the rest of your life? You're like, yeah. I'm gonna fight, you know. Yes. So then now do you join a gym? Like, what do you what do you do? Because I'm sure you're not gonna prepare how you did for that one right? the same way. You're gonna take it a little bit more serious. Yeah. So like, where did you go with that step two? Yeah. So with the step two, it was just like, you know, back then, I mean, we're talking 2000 and wow, 2010. I'm going, we're going back, man. So back then the training wasn't as structured as it is now. Absolutely. So for me, I had to figure out where I was going to go. 
and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I had to make a change. I knew I had to find a group that was going to help me get prepared at my weaknesses. What was I, even available back then? Well, I had, um, I was with uh, a guy named TJ and he had, it was called the arena and he was in Peaburg. He was so patient and I would get, cause I was terrible. I'm a sore loser, bro. Um, so for me to go in these gyms and like train with these jujitsu people, I didn't know shit. I'm just a strong, like athletic meathead that wants to knock you out. So when I'm rolling with these people, I didn't know anything. And I used to get so frustrated. And this guy, TJ, that was at Arena at the time, he was always super helpful. But then he ended up linking up with the coach that I ended up getting with was Carmelo Marrero, the yeah, former yeah. UFC heavyweight. Yeah, we had him on the podcast. Awesome. Um, pfft, remember the first studio I told you about yeah, over yeah. in Bethlehem? Yeah. He came on there. Um, and we interviewed him and he brought Mickey and a couple other guys with him because he was trying to get uh, Mickey at that point um, used to uh, doing interviews. Got gotcha. you. Because they knew what was going to go on. They were keeping yeah. it behind the scenes. But uh, uh, Carmelo's dope. Who, Mickey Gall? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, man. I, I know Mickey Gall for years before that, yeah. before that kid even had a first fight, man. Yeah. So he came on. Small world. There was a couple of other fighters with him, too. It was Chris something. Chris Cotalo. Yep. And then... Um, a younger, smooth-looking kid. I forget who he was. Yeah, um, uh, Desmond. Desmond Towns. That's in Florida now. I think little wrestler, a little small. One, yeah, they 15, all they all left the area, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Carmelo's dope. He had cool stories, and um, yeah, what's he funny, does. he knows my little brother uh, from Union stuff now. Oh shit! Yeah, nice. it's crazy how everything goes full circle. Yeah. But yeah, I was full circle in a small world. So you started working with Carmelo then? Yeah, because and he was already in the UFC at this point. No, he was done. He, he was, was done with the UFC, yeah. and he was looking to uh, spread the American top team brand right yep so i heard about american top team coming to bethlehem and i'm like get the fuck out of here i'm like we're gonna have this and gym. what gym was that that he was in it was well he opened up the location it was att but he opened it on the south side of bethlehem uh third street now it's like a playa's like it's a playa place like i'm trying to think bowl. that he was working with Rodney, who we had Rodney. on the podcast as Rodney, well. Yeah, yeah, Hammer, yeah, yeah, Hammer. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Mello yeah. was on his own at first. Yeah. yeah. Mello was on his own, and he had the backing to be able to produce ATT. But then when things started not working out, then he partnered up with Rodney and was like, hey, you know, can you help out? And they linked up into business together, and then before they combined gyms. But yeah, um, yeah I started with Carmelo on uh, South Side of Bethlehem um, on Third Street uh, ATT. Yeah, we were me and that's a few, so crazy. Me and a, me and a few guys were like the first original crew, man. Um, me, Zach Sigley, who doesn't fight anymore, and then uh, Jake Gombos. Like Jake Gombos was like that guy. Like I literally got introduced to Jake, and he he's actually one of my my best friends now. We train all the time. He's at the gym and stuff, and. Um, I literally got introduced. Melo introduced me to him to pretty much like a, it was like a greeting to like, are you tough enough? He literally, I was in there with no experience. I had no shin guards, no headgear. All I had was 16, oh I had 16 ounce boxing gloves, right? Title boxing gloves, piece of shit. And uh, he literally puts me in the cage with Jake. And Jake was training down at the HQ American Top Team down uh, in Coconut Creek. So he was training with all the killers down there fucking, um, oh my God. I'm forgetting the names off the top of my head. But anyways, so he was training with like Tiago Alves and uh, Hector Lumbar. And he was training with good people. So when he came and he sparred me, oh, no. <laughs> Jake literally fucking just unleashed and kicked my ass. But the thing is for me, it's like, I'm a hard-nosed Mexican. Like, I'm not going down. I'm bloody as hell. And I keep coming in your face. I keep fighting. So I guess, I don't know if it was like a test, like to see like, hey, is this guy really tough enough? Can he be a fighter? Or... I don't know. So, so basically, me and Jake, we fucking went at it. We fucking sparred. And then uh, Jake became one of my really close friends. And we're still friends to this day. Yeah, so man. you started training with him. And then when was your second fight then? Yes. Yeah, so was that through? That was through him. Yeah. yeah we went to, uh, we actually went to Virginia. Um, it was with Mello. And um, we were just trying to line up a fight. And he kind of wanted to get us like an experience of pro rules. So we went down and we fought in like, it was like Norfolk, Virginia. Were you nervous? Honestly, That's a long ride. Honestly, I wasn't that nervous um, because of like the talent that we had. Yeah, so yeah, like the yeah, people yeah, that we were yeah. fighting there, they were like fucking some random dudes like off the street that just, <laughs> yeah. like, they're like, yeah, but they <laughs> might have that living room guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> they were trading, they were trading in fucking in somebody's garage and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah. guy was 15 pounds overweight and I still fought. I won my guillotine again. Yeah. And, uh, 
yeah, we just went down there and cleared house. It was me, Jake, and my and my boy Zach Sigley. We went down there and we just yeah, it's got because it's got to feel nice at this point to feel like you're prepared. Yes, we're like you know you went through the first one, then this one you're like working with professionals, and now yeah. you're like sharpening up your skills, and then you know there's probably a lot more confidence going into something, Definitely. especially with having like mellow, you know, on your back with that. It was nice. It's good to know like when you have that corner and support with you. It's good to have that feeling. So it, it builds that confidence in your fighter. So when you go in there, you know, like, I prepared. I did everything with him. I'm ready to go. I have the confidence to to go and execute. And it's got to be wild just to, uh, you know, like, I always think, you know, when we're down here watching the UFC or any of the big yeah. fights or any of the boxing, I'm like, I wonder what's going through that dude's head. Like, as he's coming out to the arena and, yes. you know, even on a small level, like what yes. you said, it's like they lock that door and it's just the two of you. And it's like, you know, to control your breathing and, uh, you know, not to have a panic attack. Or, dump, you, know, honestly, you know what I mean? Like, the yeah, adrenaline the adrenaline dump. dump. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be wild to, yes. uh, I mean, I, I mean, I feel like you would get addicted to that and just chase after it constantly. That's why it's a, that's why I say it's like a drug. Um, because it's something with those endorphins and the things get released in your brain to have that feeling of like a rush. Yeah. It's something you can't replace. And um, like even what I'm doing now, like training people, they can see like when I walk out, like, <laughs> like when I walk out with my fighters, it's like you can feel the passion in me still. Like I'm like, I'm ready to I'm ready to fight. Like I'm ready to go fuck somebody up because I feel like I feel those nerves again. Well, you, like, you hear it from the announcers sometimes that are the retired fighters and they're like, This makes me want to fight. And then they like, you know, and then um some of them don't even like going into the uh the arena. Yeah. yeah. Some just can't some just, just can't not stand wanting it. to uh, want to do it again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like why put yourself around it? Yeah. Because you know you're not gonna do it. But exactly. that must be wild to uh you know, drive down like that, and then that ride home is probably that's probably so fucking awesome, dude. It was fucking, it <laughs> was know? it was a blast, man. We fucking went down, took over Virginia. We all won, and it's got to it's got to feel like you actually did that too. You know what I mean? Like everybody wins. You come home, you fuck everybody up, yep. and you're driving back. And yeah, it's just, remember this part? Remember that part? That's gotta be a blast. Yeah, it was it was awesome, man. It was a good connection for us as like a as a fighting crew at the time because we were new. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody knew me, Jake. Uh, Zach, they they didn't know us as fighters yet because the area didn't really know about the mixed martial arts fighting. Like they really weren't on it yet. We they were kind of behind, and um, but we always had great wrestlers in Pennsylvania, so it's like yeah. an easy transition for these guys. For me, I was a striker, a boxer, so it was like, all right, well, this kid's flashy. He, he can knock people out. He's got power in his hands. There's I'm an athlete, so there was potential in me. I'm like charismatic, so there was like it's potential, but there was like you don't have that grappling ability. So that's what I got with these guys, and we just grew over the years. And uh, yeah, man, it was a cool thing we had in the South Side of Bethlehem with the American Top Team, and uh, yeah, it ended up spreading off, and I ended up linking up with the Finishers Crew, but we'll go there too eventually, probably. Yeah. So where does it go from here then? Now you're looking for more fights, and yeah. you know, are you working full time and doing training at the same time? Yeah. So at the time, I was. It's crazy because I was. It's crazy because I had my my job with security and I started there as a basic security officer and I worked my way up all the way to being a supervisor there and I was pretty much like running the place. But um, I was doing that as I was being a fighter. So my fighting career and my like security life was like was going on at the time. So, yeah, I had a I had a full time job and I was full time training. Yeah. So as an amateur, it's like you kind of get a little more leisure because you don't have to worry about cutting the weight and get worrying about like selling all these tickets and like doing the professional things. But when you go professional, it's like now your livelihoods on the line. Now you're like, you're thinking about, I have to really make a, a point in my career to excel and grow. I can't just be this basic person just going in there and just trying to fight and hope I win. It's like, I'm trying to build here. You go professional. It's like, you're really trying to develop a long career, at least for me. Cause I was a fighter and I wanted to fight. It's something I really wanted to do. But as an amateur, it's like I tell these guys I train all the time. Like I train artists and Jamie, you know, and Jordan, like a bunch of these people at the gym. And I'm like, dude, like get as much experience as you can. Cause I didn't. I, f you know, what's dope with me is that I made my mistakes. I think we were talking, when we were talking about this when I came in, you went through the trials and errors of going through the podcast and knowing how to set things up and the microphones and all the shit that you had to really develop and learn on your own. 
that's what I did as a fighter. Yeah. I didn't have nobody, nobody laid out like a blueprint for me. Nobody was telling me, hey, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Um, in order to create the success, we gotta train here. It, I didn't have that. I was kind of like a lost guy just learning on the job. So with these amateur guys, I tell them all the time, get as many motherfucking fights, get it, get as much as you can. Get the grappling tournaments, get the get the amateur boxing bouts. I could take them to the amateur boxing bouts, get the kickboxing bouts. Whatever you can get, get because I didn't. So I basically that's why I started my so I started my brand here. That's why I started the brand um, because I want to make sure that people are getting the right toolage and the right education and the good understanding of what it takes to be successful as a as either a fighter or just in life. Yeah, I mean, um, failing is so important to doing anything because that's how you learn not to make mistakes later. And like with the, I mean, even when we were talking about the food and all that, and like, you know, I, I ran the gauntlet of having the t-shirt company and it not doing what I wanted it to do. And then you realize how things really work. And then, you know, you have to just kind of eat a bunch of plates of shit that you don't want to. And it's like, as much as that affects your mood and could put you in a bad space, you know, back then, you yeah. know, I look at, and it's so funny where people are like, oh, you just got to stick with something. You got to learn from your mistakes. And yeah. it's like, it's such easy Easier sayings. Easier said than done. But then when you look back on it, I'm like, oh, that's what that was. Like the reason I'm making better decisions now and the moves that I'm about to make this year are all completely calculated and they're all ran by other business people like JM and yes. Zach and other people who run restaurants that I know and you know my other business people that I keep around me. And then, then they tell you where they fucked up and everybody's honest about each other. Yeah. Um, well, most people people are but like you know then that you you have direction and like what you're saying is you develop your blueprint with other yeah. people who are drawing blueprints and then now you can really accomplish shit that most people can't in a fashion so it's like the people that you're working with they're going to fail on their own and they're going to make their own blueprint but they're going to make it inside of the one that you created so there's more room for them to build yes and it's like being able to do that for other people is awesome it's one of my favorite things to do with this show yeah but it's also one of my favorite things to like tell people all the time like yo like i you know i went out to dinner with my mom at the re the restaurant and the bar that i started this entire business and it was super emotional i didn't know it would fuck me up that bad but i left and i was like man there was some fucked up shit that went on there with a girl i dated and the, you know i bought my dog there yeah. that i had to put down like last year like so, history so there's a lot of history and it's yeah. raw but i was like I, I said to my mom i'm like how fucking crazy is this and my mom was like you know, we're having a beer and it's like, I like when I get to like, just kind of hang with my mom. Cause we used to do that when we were younger and you know, she's just like, doesn't it seem like a lifetime ago? And it is a lifetime ago. It's like this version of me that lived and failed and didn't give up on it and oh didn't settle God. for a nine to five. And Sounds it's like, like me. dude, it's so hard to actually push through all that bullshit. And it's why I love highlighting it on here is like, it's not fucking easy to just totally fail and keep going oh my God. and keep going you know and to keep pick going up? Hell yeah. there's so i have rough. the amount of people that just give up on shit and settle for a nine to five and like they're not happy and like that you know and then it's like sometimes i just look at people i know or i run into and i'm just like man like why aren't you trying to do what you to me it's so not normal to completely give up everything and go after everything to enjoy what you want in life yes and then some people are just like yeah and I'm just like, that is not my demon. I wish, I mean, I don't, but like, nah. if if I could sleep without, you know what I mean? Without, oh, I, I, I need this. And then, but when I have this, you know, I never knew what crossing the finish line would be. And then when, when I had a con, like contentness of, oh, I don't got to worry about going to work on Monday because this is now my life. And, yeah. you know, now my big thing that I preach on here is freedom. Yes. Once you have that freedom to yes. do whatever the fuck you want. It's funny because I was like talking to Zach and I'm like, you know, like I'm like, I got I got to focus on money this year. And he's just like <laughs> laughing. And I'm like, are, it's, are I'm all? like, I'm like, but I don't I don't usually when I when I got the freedom, I stopped focusing on making money because the money didn't fucking matter. And like, I used to think that like, I'm going to do all this shit and I'm going to end up on an island and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I am going to have these things. Dreams, their goals. I am going to have these things where my life is way better to live. But like, I, once I got the freedom, I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I'm like, I don't really care about money. I don't really care about anything else. I'm like, that's what the itch was. The yes. itch that was like making me fucked up every day. The itch that was making me get out of bed and run eight miles. Like that itch. Yes. I was like, oh, that was scratched. 
I have complete and total freedom. And then that's what I push to people now when they're like, they want advice on shit. And I'm like, go after the freedom. Go after the freedom of you don't hate Sundays because you have to wake up wake Monday. Up. Go go after, um, you know, like how I set my schedule up is like I hit it heavy in the beginning of the week and I slow it down by Thursday. And then by Friday, it's, it's I'm posting and doing some social media. And the weekend's mine to do pop-ups or watch UFC. But like, that's how I want to live. So like that freedom is worth way more than money. I could have a fucking shitload of money in the bank and just be miserable. Of course. And then like now it's are. now like I was saying to Zach, I'm like, all right, now I gotta focus on putting money in the bank and like building this and wanting more. And but now I see myself turning into a businessman. And it's like sometimes you just gotta you gotta humble yourself and be happy. Then you can create the things that you want out of it. Indeed. Where were you at when you were like you know, you have a couple of fights in and, you know, you're building and you're going through this and all that is like, when did this start becoming a thing where you're like, I want to make a living off of this. I want to make a career off of this. Somehow I want to turn this into, this is what I do in my life. Cause that's not easy either, easy either. Nah. Cause if you don't start winning or getting the opportunities yeah. to get into the UFC, which was way different back then, yes. you still have to find out a way to live in your piece so like when did you start developing that yeah so that was oh my god that was so hard but for i'm me, sure it was impossible it, it was it was hard to battle because i'm thinking in my head i'm like i'm gonna make this work i don't know why i always had that thought in my head that i'm going after my passion i love what i do i'm happy with what i'm doing and i'm gonna make this work and um uh, things kind of just started just falling into place in a sense because I was going on a tear as an amateur and um, a lot of hype was built behind me. Then all of a sudden I started linking up with, when I linked up with Scott Heckman, Scott Heckman was telling me he trained with me at ATT at the I time. I want to get him on here. Uh, I wanted to talk to him when he was still competing, but just to hear his story and then what he's doing now, I think oh, is shit. so awesome. I know, I know, man. And I, he always, me and him, he's another one. He's another person that's like, He's still in my life all the time, and Scott's like a big brother to me. He's always looked out for me. He even still looks out for me like after fighting. So Scott, Scott's an awesome person, and uh, he'd be a good person to have on, man. He's super cool. But um, but yeah, when I linked up with Scott, then we started cross training because I was like, I'm here at ATT. Mellow's, you know, my coach and stuff, and I have people here that are helping me. But I'm like, it's not enough. So that's when I started cross training and I started going to Whippany, New Jersey um, at AMA Fight Club, it was called. And uh, that's where Jim Miller was, Dan Miller was, Charlie Brenneman, Rafael Oravara, like a bunch of UFC guys were at this gym training. And I'm like, this is what I need. Like, I need to be with the best if I want to be the best. So when I'm on my tear as an amateur, I link up with them and then their manager, who was Mike Constantino, um, he ran a management company, MVC management and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm around these UFC people, you know, I'm getting the management behind them. I'm like, I'm really going to take this on. Like, I'm going to take this full fledged. And I did. So after like, I think it was my, I did one amateur fight with them. So it was like, I had like four or five amateur fights total. I was already older. I started my career late. So when I came out of college and I came home, I was already 20 some years old. When I started fighting, it was like I was 25, 26. So in my head, I'm like, I'm old. I'm like, I'm old. I got to make this shit happen now. If I want to make a run back then, I'm like, I got to do this shit now. Because if not, it's going to be too late. I'm going to be too old. Or it's not going to happen. So I rushed. Went with them. Felt confident and went went professional. And that's when things like started to get all fucked up because of the management and like the way things were run with my career. It was just crazy. But uh, yeah, um, there was that point in my amateur career where I was like, this is it. Like I'm doing everything for this. And I committed everything to it um, with my with my job still being like I was able to balance both where I can work and then still train. It's still really hard to do. It was so hard, especially like when I worked two years overnights, like I would work 11 to seven. Yeah. And then I would stay up sometimes and get a run and then sleep and then wake up and train two times and then go to work overnight. Like, yeah, it was a rough fucking schedule for some, some of those years, but, um, I don't, I don't regret none of it, man. I, uh, I loved every minute of it, man. I love the lifestyle of it. And it's why I miss it every day. Still. Like I, I get offers to fight still and I'm thinking about like coming out of retirement sometimes and I'm thinking like, yo, I'm going to come fight again. But then I think about it. I'm like, I'm fucking 36 years old. I got to think beyond this shit now, man. Like yeah. there's more to life than that. And now I'm thinking like you where I'm thinking business oriented. I'm yeah. thinking on that, on, on the terms of that, instead of thinking of me being, uh, 
the commodity being sold. Like, it's just me. I'm putting my body on the line. I'm selling this for that to make the promotion look good. Like, I'm tired of that shit, man. I, I want to start building for myself, building for my brand, and start doing other things outside of fighting because I'm now I'm even trying to get into real estate too. So I'm trying to do it all, man. I'm trying to do it all now. But at that point in my life, I, I dove in and I made everything happen for it with a management team, with, you know, with a UFC crew that I thought was going to... Well, they were awesome. I mean, they were, they were great partners. They were helping me get ready and stuff. But like, I thought I was in the right place, but I wasn't doing the right things. So. Yeah. When, when you realized that that was kind of the moment, what, what did you want? Where did you want to pivot to? Or like, what was the first thing that you started looking to keep in the industry, but kind of step back a little bit? Was it coaching right away? Yeah. Um, the thing is with that, it was definitely coaching because, I, oh man, it's nuts how I even got my brand and started doing my business because I was a selfish motherfucker. <laughs> I can't even lie, dude. Like, my whole fighting career was all about me. Um, I cared about my training, I didn't care about anybody else. But I noticed, like, the way I was in rooms with people, they would be like, hey, you know, you're giving some good information, or hey, you're doing this well. And then uh, when I started like doing like little helpful things for people, I started feeling like, okay, I could possibly do this. But then it come later on till later on in my career. When I fought, I put everything into it. Yeah. I, didn't th I didn't think about nothing but fighting, whether it was mixed martial arts or boxing. I committed myself to both. Like I was the elite in either one. I don't care how shitty my record was. I don't care how many fights I lost. I didn't give a shit. I always treated myself like a professional and i always treated myself like i was the elite world champion i always took it very seriously so i didn't even think about training people i didn't even think about business i only thought about me yeah. i was very selfish and i think i feel like i feel like a lot of fighters do this but a lot of fighters don't let it go and i had that moment in one of my training sessions at the end of my career um where i started not feeling invincible anymore i started noticing i was feeling shots and that was like the wake up call for me. Like, I don't know if it was God's word to me or whatever it was, a spiritual moment, but it was just like, dude, like you can't do this shit anymore. Like you got to start thinking beyond this now. Like you have more to offer than just being the warrior out there. You know what I'm saying? Like you have more to give than just being that warrior, you know, on the front lines, taking the punishment. Like you just got more than this. So yeah, some spoke to me, man. And then all of a sudden I was like, I'm gonna start coaching people. And uh, it took off and, it's doing pretty well, so I can't complain, man. No, it's it's cool. Uh, you're kind of honest about like the selfishness and whatnot. And I, yeah. I don't I don't think it's uh, I don't know. Like I can relate to it. Um, when I got sober and then I started creating all this. Um, uh, I like what you said. I, I put everything into it. I, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing back then. I, I didn't know. know um, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know anything. But all I knew is. I needed to create another shirt and I needed to, to make this bigger. And then um, when you said that about the being selfishness and putting all that into it, it, it kind of registered where I don't know if it's a selfishness or it's a, a behavioral pattern that develops in order for you to be obsessively trying to get to a goal that you know in your mind you can accomplish, but you want to get there. So you have to give everything 100% and not give a fuck about everything around you. And like when I did that, with the clothing company, I got far with it, but then it was the same thing where I was at a point where I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. And I wasn't like, um, you know, I was going to conventions and, you know, um, I was just not happy doing this thing. And then, um, you know, I didn't know if it was something that was created. And then I realized it was something that would developed in there that was just keeping me sober. So I was addicted to, yes. to just doing it and doing it and doing yeah. it and doing it. And it was like, I developed a really awesome, clean path that like I can live in now and like, like there's things that I've learned in there. Like when you were saying about how you, you were professional and you did it on a, a high level, that's how you're going to do anything that you do in business and life now. Anything. And I think sometimes when you don't pull out of that and you don't know the correct time to pull essentially a dive bomb, because that's really yeah. where it gets you. Seriously. If you don't have the right people around you or it goes to the next level. But I think eventually it's just going to keep going down. Cause you can't, you can't do that for forever. Can't. But, um, you know, there, there are important takes to get out of that where, you know, when I was doing that and then, you know, I stopped, I remember I stopped doing the clothing and I was like, or the whole business. Cause I remember I made a post about it. My friend texted me and was like, you shouldn't have publicly announced that. Cause I don't think you're done with it. And I was just like, I'm done. Yeah. And then 
I started thinking about it again. And then I started realizing that that's how I look at life where like, I'll see a design and I'll be like, oh, that's a t-shirt. Oh, that's that. Oh, that's that. And then you realize that you're obsessed and you, you, I found a passion I didn't even know I enjoyed because I was selfishly smothering it. Yeah. And then when I let it breathe and come back, it was like this new form of like how I want to live and how I want to do it. And now I just kind of, you know, I'm not, it's just not never again clothing. Then it became never again studio. And then when I had studio, then I could, all right, well, we're now we can do yeah. never again radio. All right, well, we got studio kitchen. All right, well, if we do the comedy show, that's studio live. And then it's yes. like, I'm no longer pigeonholed myself into that one thing. So when you said that, it triggered a lot of stuff that went parallel with how I live. So like when you're coming out of that and now you're looking at this new, found life in this new direction and this new lane Seriously. that you're in what is that like for you to transition then and then now start trying to guide people to get them to maybe get to where you're where you were going with better vision of things yeah it was oh man it's crazy when i go into this conversation because i still struggle it was one of the hardest i never realized how hard it was going to be to to transfer from the fighter life to regular life um, I thought it was just going to be a simple ride. You know, I had my ups and downs, but I was going to have my, my journey set for after fighting. It wasn't going to be like, okay, well I'm done fighting and then I'll just get a job and it'll be okay. No, it wasn't that easy. Cause once I stopped fighting, I'm like, what's my purpose? What, what do I provide now? Like, I'm not, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm not a fighter anymore. I was like losing my identity. It's like, who, do, who the fuck are you? Like, who are you now? So <clears throat> the blessing of creating the business and brand that I created, it was just like a blessing to be able to be involved, still have uh, input on fighting, but to provide information to others that I didn't get. So by me having the ability to do that for these people now, all the people that I train, that whether just regular clients or all the fighters at the gym, it's just it's just such a uh, a new fulfillment of my life now that I'm able to give that back now because when I hear them respond to me and they're like, oh, damn, I didn't look at it that way. That's awesome. Thank you for the help or thank you for the advice. Thank you for the technique. Like these certain things, like it gives me that fulfillment now where I thought after fighting, I'm like, I'm not going to get it from this anymore. I'm just going to not be a fighter anymore. Move on, get a job, do that bullshit. But then in my head, I'm like, Nah, fuck this. I I literally left my job. I literally, once I was done fighting, I was done with my job too. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this place. Yeah, am, it's good when you cut ties like that to like- I, I am over this shit, dude. Dump it all out. Yeah. Get out of here. Dude, it, and it was crazy because when, when I did this, people told me they're like, well, my family. Like a lot of a lot of people that are close to you, like your family, they're yeah. like, what are you doing? Like you're messing up. Oh, uh, like, yeah. Dude, <laughs> I still get it to this day, like- you know, why are you leaving your job? You know, you got to have a job. And I'm like, as I'm looking and I'm starting to see the successful people, they don't fucking go to jobs and like rely on getting advancements in their in their company and yeah. have success. God bless you that if you do well, good for you, man. That's great. I'm glad you get it and it worked out for you. But me personally, who I am, it just doesn't work that way. I just don't function that way where... I get satisfied off that. I no. Get, I get bored by that shit. Yeah. I and, and it also takes a specific type of person to jump ship and build their own thing and keep it building. And now it's like, you know, like I look at moves where it's like, all right, well, if I wouldn't have done that and started the clothing company, then, you know, I, all right, well, I took a chance with the podcast and the podcast got bigger. Then I took a chance with the food. Then I left my, my real job and went into this full time and I get by. But then now me just getting by has now completely changed my life where I'm about to open a restaurant with one of my best friends who I didn't think that if I opened up a restaurant with anybody, it would be her out of all people. Yeah. And we just work so well together. But then I can now also have the freedom because I learned how to be free to keep my podcast going. And then I'm like, oh man, like now I can like run this business, run that business. And then now because I'm multitasking and running multiple businesses, now I'm seeing down the road where, you know, everybody's congratulating me on what I'm doing now. But I'm, ar I'm already I'm already t thinking in my head like, yo, I want to get real estate in Florida. And I'm like, what if I start doing Airbnb? See? 
Airbnbs. And then I was yes, like, I was like, what am, I was like, what if I got an Airbnb Dude. in Florida and put this old equipment down there? And now I start networking down in Florida. And then I'm like, day. oh, I'm like, I could get so many people. I'm like, Ad Lib just went down there. He probably knows a ton of people in yep. the music. I know there's a bunch of fighters down there. I got a bunch the of fighters. Planet stuff's yep. down there. Yep. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, I could be going to Florida yes. on my days off and just doing an entirely new podcast from Florida, but then coming back here. But I own the business. So yes, I got to keep it running for two years, but then somebody's going to take my position. Exactly. And then now I'm paying them salary to run my business. And then yes. I'm like, holy shit. shit. I'm like, I can do really whatever get, the dude. fuck I want. But it's not, <laughs> it's not from the standpoint of saying I can do whatever the fuck I want. It's I learned how to run business. And that is not fucking easy, especially that I've never gone to any schooling. You know what I mean? Me like either. there's just people who get degrees and run other people's businesses. But then I feel like there's a breed of people who just have to do something on their own you because they ju I just like building. I like building. Yeah. I like building. I like figuring things out. Yeah. I do not like, like being, solving I do not like being in a factory fucking line. I tried doing factory work. Oh, I My did father too. worked at a factory. I, did too. I was never embarrassed of being working class. Oh, I, no. I, I didn't care about not going to college. Um, you know, my, my father and my mom, you know, my mom's a nurse, but between the two of them, they have, we didn't grow up poor. So like, I was like, well, if you're making a living and we have all these nice things, factory work ain't that bad. But then when I realized factory work was standing there and not doing anything like you know i'm you know i remember cooking how can you function like that and feel I'm, i'll never forget cooking and looking at the guy across from me and it was right when i figured out who action bronson was and i was like how does this motherfucker get to do whatever he wants i said how does he get to do rapping how does he get to do food how does he get to yeah. do a food show i yeah. go i go i go what would it be like to be that guy who just wakes up and does whatever and even watching him now we're like he goes on tour and he's taking the alchemist but he's also yeah, in shape sick, now man. and doing like yeah. you know what i mean like he he his whole life is just his living and I never understood why people wouldn't want to do that but I also understand that some people don't want to do that which is no. okay but I don't live that way I don't work that way and I definitely don't tick that way Yeah, and that's I why it's awesome way, meeting dude. people like JM and yourself and Zach and all these other people that I meet through the network that are doing their own thing and it's like if you're around those people it rubs off on you that's why I linked up with them man like they just literally when just... did you link up with them yeah, I'm gonna uh, open that beer you can keep yeah, talking yeah I was gonna say no no I'm, no, no. If you, uh, I'll pour dude, it, I'm gonna roll it I'm gonna roll it and crack <laughs> I gotta break. I gotta break down the lactose in this beer. The beer snob is working to the fullest, fullest um, ability right now. But yeah, there's man. lactose in that beer. Yeah, yeah I've only it, ever it, had one beer like that was from La Cabra, I think. Okay, uh, outside of Philly. Yeah, this is uh, Armor PA. Yeah. Um, it was that's my favorite beer, so I think this is going to be something I really enjoy. Oh, I think really. <laughs> I, I I don't know, man. I mean, I'm a beer snob to the fullest, so like, I've transitioned. Like we were talking before we started talking here, it was like. You could drink like Baton Ribbon and Miller Lite. Like, I go back to those beers and I'm just like disgusted, dude. Like, I, I can't even do it anymore. I like dude. my garage beers. <laughs> I, I, hey, I don't knock you, bro. I don't um, knock you, but now, like, no, there's usually the good quality. beer. It's there's the usually quality. good beer in the fridge, especially with like McCall comes down here for McCall's the pop up, so people will bring beer. McCall is awesome, man. I'm a big fan of McCall, dude. Big fan. Awesome brew. Yeah, enjoy that strawberry milkshake, by the way. Cheers. Salud, brother. Let's enjoy. Let me know what you think. That's really good. Oh, yeah. It's smooth, man. It's super smooth. Um, That's how the other one was. Because awesome. I kept saying to my friend, I'm like, I'm like, what is that? And he's like, it's the lactose or whatever they do yep. with that. I'm not, I know oh, nothing about it. I just know it's so it's, awesome. Because it reminds me of a wheat beer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so it has like the lactose and then plus they add like the strawberries and uh, the, the citra mosaic. That's so mosaic. good. That's ah, so good. So awesome. So what's, what's the name of it? Yeah, it's just the strawberry milkshake from Tired Hands. Yeah. Yeah, strawberry milkshake IPA. Yep. And uh, Tired Hands is the outside of Armour, um, outside of Philly there. Um, cool spot. But now with Philly, like having those restrictions now, it kind of sucks. It's like, I'm not sure if you can go in there unless you're vaccinated now and... I used to go. I used to go there all the time. Like I got into this beer game, like, you know, probably like three or five years ago now, and uh, I really started getting into it because of some of these brews. I heard about. The I figured you were into. It. Usually, when someone's like, "Hey, I'll bring some IPAs," which I always enjoy, um, but like real people who are really into beer, um, they're usually like, "Hey, I'll bring beer." I got you. Yeah, I was. That's why I was like, if I'm coming down and I've had your burgers and shit, I'm like. I'm not gonna come here empty-handed. I'm gonna come bring some for it, man. Dude. Huh, anytime. An, an man, afternoon beer is nice, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I'm not even used to this. The, uh, man. This ain't even me right here. I had uh, that Lucas guy on, uh, who's a like 
I've never had somebody make me a better drink than what he did on the show. Really? But he made like this old fashioned. It was called um, something silver, the Duke Silver. Okay. Um, and we had one, and I was talking to him, and I was like, "Yo, like I'm I'm pretty buzzed." And he's like, "Me too." <laughs> he's like, "You really can't have any one." You know, it's one of those where the drink is just made with all liquor. Okay. Um, you know, uh, but it was super smooth. But it's cool networking because now, like, we're gonna do a comedy show down here, and like, well, it's a comedy taping, and then um, I was like, "Bro," I was like, "You know, do you want how much would it be for you to come down?" And he's like, "I make money, dude." He's like, "I'll come down and do shit." So he's yeah, gonna come down awesome. and bartend, and I was like, "Cool." I'm like, "I'll make sure you get content." Yeah, you're gonna get they film me and shit and uh but he was just like yeah i'll totally do that uh that's, that's so what's cool, cool about man. doing the show is like or anyone like zach will be like you know anybody it's the the craziest conversation i've had with zach is he goes do you know anybody who could get me a wrestling ring and i go yes <laughs> and he just went lol and he's like really and i'm like yeah hold Tag on me in, brother rick flair baby and then i hit up uh <laughs> i hit up uh reject from lehigh valley apparel that's creations because awesome. he puts on wrestling shows nice and then he was just like yeah this is what Wait, it would at? be um, he does them all over. Usually okay. he does like a, you since the pandemic, crazy? he had, he did one in a mall. Like he just finds cool locations and do them. I used to see, I used to train in Allentown, uh, boxing gym and they were like, oh my God, where the, f I I'm forgetting. I'm drawing a blank of where they were off. They were in this fucking hole in the wall. They basically like they were in the garage, but next door there was a wrestling like practice facility. And like these guys were like, oh, well, the finishers did an event at that place. Uh, where the hell was it? It was one of the finishers they held it where the guy had a wrestling ring and they um, there was a plane in the building. Yeah. I forget what finishers it was, but then they bitched because, uh, you know, it's. I think when people agree to do that event with Zach, they don't realize that people are coming. Yep. And then, oh, yeah. and then there's like the amount of a shitload attending. of cars. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. It's yeah, cra And then what's funny is that crazy is that's getting even bigger. It's so dope, man. Yeah. That's why I like surrounding myself with those type of people. Like we we're talking about the people you're around is what helps uh, produce a lot of success. So if you're around those type of people, you're going to grow. So that's why I love being around them. And I'm so blessed that they brought me on with them. And when did you link up with those guys? <sighs> when they were at uh, Rodney's place. Yeah. Um, when they were inside, they were like me. So basically they were training, doing their stuff inside of Rodney's gym. Yep. Basically what I'm doing now, I'm training inside of their finisher's gym. So it's like, yeah, they were on the back mat. And uh, they had their like gi pants on, and I saw Ten Planet shit, and I'm like, "What the hell's that?" <laughs> Looked up. Who are these lunatics? No, not even, not <laughs> yeah, even, not, yeah. even, not even one of these lunatics. But yeah. like, what the fuck is ten, what's Ten Planet? What, what is that? Yeah. And then um, obviously I knew it was like some type of grappling, but I didn't know how deep the jujitsu was. Then I started watching Eddie Bravo. Then I was like, "Holy shit, this guy is about fighting." Yeah. He's not about just regular traditional gi. It's cool when you first look into it. Yeah, I remember when I saw them, or um, you know, because I knew Dan from doing the show, and then he introduced me to him, and then Wait, we Dan uh, uh, Spearden or however yeah, from Cryo. Yeah, I call yeah. Dan the man. Yeah, I call him Dan yeah. the man, bro. He's um, my fucking guy. Yeah, man. so Dan's been on the show, and then he was like, "Hey, you know, I have these two friends, or because they were living at Dan's house, and then they were like, yeah. they need a podcast space to do a, a podcast with Eddie Bravo." And I think Zach gave me like 50 bucks and I was just like, cool, man, like yeah, whatever, use it. it. And then he was like, oh, it was cool you have all this stuff. And then that's how I met Zach and JM. And then I asked them to come back on the show. And then when you start looking into what they're doing and like who their sensei is and like that whole thing with what they're doing and like, Excuse then you start seeing like what came out of that school. And it's still hard to wrap your head around how it's talented and uh, how good those two really are and the fact that they even work together. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? But like they're it's the yin and yang, yin and yang They're yeah. the yin and yang, dude. Yeah, they're, they're but fucking, I mean, and the, but for the two of them to be doing it this long still, and like just still to have working that like that, poor yeah. relationship yeah. like that. A lot of times with business, a lot of things go south because when money and like the way you run a business, a lot of pride takes over. Yeah, but with them guys, it's just like, nah, we fucking get it. Like you have your opinions, I have mine. But we're gonna work to make this thing a successful business, and they're always growing. Um, I think I, I think JM's coming back on next week. Hey, yeah. I'm excited to get. I love into the, it. I love yeah. to be on with him, bro. Yeah. Like I had I had the one podcast where we were all together. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. The, I want to. I eventually, I think it'll come full circle to where we have enough time to do that. Plus, with setting up podcast studios, I think are going to be coming in the finishers, so like it'll be easier to do stuff. I hope I, I in a new place. I, I hope love a new place soon, man. I loved when um you guys all came down here and it was like Preet and JM. And then everybody was just kind of sitting around drinking beers and bullshitting. After it was everybody was done training, yeah. Um, and that was a rad show because it was just people just like everybody was just sharing old fight stories and all yeah. that. And, like they kept apologizing to me, and I'm like, dude, I'll sit dude, here and listen to this shit all, all day, fucking day, dude. Yeah, 
You know why? Because, you know, you get to see and uh, hear these real life experiences and, yeah. and emotions and feelings from these people that endured some shit. Like, we, like JM talking about how he was like fighting grown men. <laughs> like, yeah, as a kid. Yeah, as a yeah. kid, dude. That shit's he's a, nuts. A kid from Tiger Showman. He's yeah. fucking fighting some grown ass men. Like, uh, yeah, JM's my guy, bro. JM's fucking awesome, man. You yeah. Know what I'm saying we just, me and him, man, like a lot of people, you know, a lot of times you get mixed feelings and like misunderstandings of people. But when you really just sit down and like kick it with him, man, he's fucking cool, man. Jam, yeah, Jam he came guy, down man. for a, a pop up and was just hanging out, having beers, and we, you know, he. But it was before he had the baby. I think he yeah. he came down a couple times for fights, and like you know, he's getting married now. You know, he's got a kid, um, and especially with what he's doing now, like I love he, seeing he's, his growth. Yeah, he's, he's in a changed. he's in a fucking lane. <laughs> he's in a lane right and now. I love it, dude. Yeah, but yeah. that that motivates us. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, and then to be able to have a couple beers with him down here and just get to hang out, it was fucking rad. Yeah. Where were they at when you first started kind of working with them? Because I know. Yeah, Rodney with the, the school. The hammer. school has changed so many different times yeah. before it became headquarters. Yep, exactly. So when I was with them in the Hammer Fitness, that was in the back mat area. Yeah. At Rodney's place. Then they had their small place by, uh, what was it, Jimmy John's? Yeah. The little small little that's place when I first, there. That's when I first met them. Cause oh, okay. I, right down the road, I was doing uh, cheesesteaks. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. You remember it's by Easton High School, you yep. said, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, I met. Uh, so, then when I was doing fight camps, I wanted to have the jujitsu. And I loved the Eddie Bravo, 10 Planet stuff. And those are my guys. They're super cool. So I was like, so I'm going to come here for fight camps and just roll around. They're like, dude, anytime. Like, they never questioned me as far as, like, when I came or, you know, what I was paying them. Like, anytime I would pay them, they were like, dude, don't even give me this. Like, they were just so cool and just very helpful because they just saw, I guess, like, the passion I had for martial arts. Like, they knew I just wanted to be a better fighter and they wanted to help me. And that's what I think us have. We have that respect with one another because they knew the passion and the the humbleness I had when I came in that room. It wasn't like, oh, I'm this, this fighter and I'm trying to do what the fuck I want. Like, I really came in. I wanted to listen to them. I wanted to absorb all the knowledge they had because I wasn't a good jujitsu fighter. Like, I wasn't a grappler. Like they And they know that. So they, every time I came in, they were always adjusting to what I needed. And I, I got none but high respect for them guys. They're fucking awesome because they always looked out for me when even, you know, I wasn't bringing much to them guys at the time and i knew they were just coming up so i knew they were struggling and i knew the gym was like a hard thing to deal with but they always showed open arms so i started with jimmy john then i went to jimmy john's with them and then obviously the other gym where the they Redner's were at location. Redner's location when they got the big jujitsu sign yeah, out from yeah so then i went there and now obviously hq and now i'm running you know my thing out of the out of the gym there man and they have a great setup there, and it's so awesome, man. It's such a blessing to be with that crew, man. They're they're dope, man. When you started um, doing that, about what time? Because I want to get into your brand. Yeah. When, when did you start developing the brand? Yeah, the pandemic, dude. I started with the fucking pandemic out of the most horrible times. Like I said, um, it was probably like two years ago, two, two and a half, maybe three years ago now. I uh, I was done with fighting, and I was done with my job. I'm like, you know what? I don't want this shit anymore. And I'm like, I started training people like on the side and things started really working and started jumping off. And I'm like, fuck this. I'm going with it. I'm going full fledged just like I do in my fighting career. I went full fledged, left my job, started the LLC, got my brand going. And then uh, the pandemic happened. Um, so then uh, I was worried. I'm like, shit, I just started this business. I left my job. Like, what the fuck am I going to do? And then... Uh, People didn't care, which I was very fortunate enough and blessed that people still wanted to train, even though the pandemic was going on. If you had issues, you weren't training with me, that's fine. But most of my clients were like, we don't care. We're still training. And I kept business going and I was training people one on one. And that's why. What I'm do you offer now. under the brand for uh, new clients that are coming through? Yeah, um, I usually provide like some type of merchandise. So they'll get like a free shirt. Um, I'll have them come in and they'll get like a free trial. Like they come in and try a session with me. And then basically off of that, they'll come and do that one session. Then it's like, Hey, 
you know, do you like it? Do you enjoy it? And then if they like it and enjoy it, then they talk about packages and yeah. Do you do you work with everybody kind of individually on what they want? Yes. Is it primarily just striking stuff or like yeah. weight loss or like what all do you offer? You know what's crazy? I, a, a lot of the the things that I'm known for, everybody sees like when I do the pads and I crush boxing mitts. People know me as like the boxing coach at finishers, right? But really, I provide everything because I'm an MMA fighter. So I do provide, you know, Muay Thai, you know, pads. I do kickboxing pads. I do strength conditioning workouts similar to what Brian does. I do strike uh, strength conditioning. But I also provide nutrition and meal plans as well. So one stop shop. I'm a one stop shop. So I do it all. But there's lot, so much going on in that school. But a lot of people don't know that. Like a lot of people see me and they're like, "Oh, he's the boxing coach. Like all he does is boxing mitts, which is cool. Like I I love that stuff. But I want people to know, like I provide more than just the boxing mitts. Like I can provide like actual strength conditioning workouts for you, regiments for you to lose weight. Kind of like what JM's doing right now. Yeah. Like JM's getting really big on like giving programs for people. He's understanding the macros. Like I've been on that. I went to school. I went to I went to the University of Pittsburgh for exercise science. So I do have an education on the kinesiology and physiology of what it takes to be like a high performance athlete, right? So I and, I, and honestly that's what I was going to become. I was going to become a strength and conditioning coach. But then I fell in the fighting. So now I fell in the fighting. Now I know weight cutting. Now I know nutrition plans. I know workout plans. I know all techniques. So I have everything, man. I'm pretty much a one-stop shop. That's awesome. Um, I didn't know you provided all that. I thought you were just doing basic coaching. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, didn't, I, I didn't know you I, had everything. You so how why? do people get a hold of you um, or reach out to you for yeah, that? Yeah, because I have um, an Acuity uh, app that you can go to the link. Um, I can provide you with an Acuity link. And uh, basically, you'll go on there and you'll book your appointment. You can book a free consultation to sit down with me and just discuss your goals and your plans. And then I have like packages. Well, they, actually, the packages aren't on there, but single sessions are on there where you can book a single session with me. And then basically when I have a single session with them, then I can discuss like the actual plans and like monthly plans and whatever goals they have, I can look to develop with them. And you've just been building off that since you left a career and been yeah. kind of just like housing it over at finishers and yes. then just kind of growing it and building it. Yeah. Where do you, where do you want to see it kind of go in the next year or two? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. So for me, like now we've been like, we were just talking before how like we're evolving and we're thinking business. So Excuse me. So now I'm thinking about the real estate part, right? So I'm thinking like with you, like, why can I have something in Florida? Why can I do something in Nashville, Tennessee? Like, why can I switch up Texas? Like I have people in Texas. I have people all over the place. So it's like, why can I expand and do this beyond just my area of the Lehigh Valley? Um, so in another year or so, I'm expecting to try to grow to the point where I have my own location, right? A small little studio just like they had. Um, that's the goal, but I know it takes a lot of effort and work to get to that point. But in a year or so, I'm expecting to have like something smaller for me where I can just have a private place where people can come and do the training with me, consultations, you know, all that good stuff. And, uh, but I'm thinking like you though. So like, I'm thinking like if I have my location, I want to have somebody with me where they can build and I can have them take my place. So I don't have to yeah. be the one holding the mitts. I don't have to be the one being that guy on hand to be taking the impact. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm 36 year old. I'm, I'm getting older. So it's like for me now, like I'm not trying to be this 40 some year old person holding pads. Like that's just not the, that's not the move, man. <laughs> so I'm looking to develop to the point where I have people underneath me and I have own, my own little small location. But I think the first thing and first and foremost is to develop the brand to the point where I can have my own small location. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I was, I was going to start wrapping up. Um, what what all do you want to do outside of this? Do you want to um like do you when you say you want to do like do you want to set up another school somewhere where you can fly and then like work out in Florida for a month and then yeah. work with somebody out there like you know because the more you keep talking about it, the more I'm kind of seeing the angles on it where it's like even if you went out and had your own place where somebody wanted to come in and work with you for a fight camp or something yes. or, and then you could just stay in Florida and you have a residency there but I mean you could Airbnb that when you're over here and you could kind of just totally link your schedule around all right well I'm going to be in PA a couple of months I'm going to be over here in Florida a couple of months um, I was just talking to somebody the other day about how you know, it's important to just kind of look at things without anchors. And it's like, there's a lot of anchors that people are raised on and a lot of anchors, oh which people God. think that they the have worst. to like, the worst. like, um, like owning a home, home. like, oh like the, the big thing. So like when I'm with the next move that I'm going to be doing, um, I'm going to be renting 
But I got to have something like in-house or in the same building that I'm working in and doing the podcast in because there would be no point in me paying a mortgage and then driving somewhere. And then like, I'll stop working on this. As soon as we're done here, I got to go to Stoke and then I got to come back here. Then we got to go over to the new place. Like my shit has to be together. Yeah. Like and it's got to be a small loop. Yep. So like the more I kept thinking about it, I was like, oh, well, if I wanted to do something in Florida, like, well, why wouldn't I own a home? If I if I had a mortgage payment, why should it be in the Lehigh Valley? Yes. Even the Poconos, just somewhere to get the fuck away. Yeah. But then the more I really thought about it, I'm like, oh, you could like get a destination home and then you could Airbnb that because I'm watching my friend build an Airbnb business and I'm like, oh, that's lucrative and you can do it. And if you rent it out once a month, it's paying your bills. So I'm like, even if you had a school or somewhere and like, let's say you had a school that was in a building, like say old gas station had an apartment up top. Yep. Like these buildings are all attainable yes and then i was like oh then so then if you had somewhere where people could stay if they were training with you or you could go there and then if you even had somebody running that school and you could just bounce back managing it you could really completely do whatever the fuck you want while growing your band your brand, brand and preparing fighters and people getting in shape in multi-states instead of just being in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But and, a lot of and, people think that you can't do that because of anchors. And it's like, oh, well, I need to get a home. Oh, well, I need to do this. I need to do that. And it's like, it's well, fine. I have two brothers who have regular jobs. They, they are very successful. They are very happy with their wives and they have kids. I've never, that's never been in like God bless you. my format of like, I've always wanted to just push the limits of things. So even yeah. now where I'm like, oh. I don't have to get a home here. And then I'm like, well, how far is Florida? I was talking to my friend. I'm like, I get Florida, fly to Florida in like, what, two hours? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, so if I had off Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Sunday night I took a flight to Florida, I could be in Florida for three days not dealing with this bullshit weather, yeah. getting yes. completely away from all this shit, Hell going yeah. to the beach and I then coming it. home. Love it. And I'm like, no anchors. None. No anchors. None. Yeah. You shouldn't have that's it. fucking dope that you want to grow it that way. And I think it's I think it's completely outside the box of what most people think when getting into fitness and health and that kind of thing. Yeah. You kind of get focused on like your number of clients. And I'm 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 sure over time you you get better at it, but like in the beginning, I'm sure it's just a client hustle. Yes. And then you probably oh get to a God. you probably get to a point where it's like, well, what do I do after that? Yeah. But if you expand your client hustle to different states and do different things, you can do a lot of cool shit. Yes. You can grow and you can give yourself the opportunity to not be limited, like you said, the anchor of just staying in one place. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm very fortunate and blessed that I have this area that I built up, right? So I build a reputation, I build a name, like people know me here, right? But I was never the person that just wanted to settle and be like, this is okay. This is enough. So I always think beyond of what I'm doing. So even like I was the first person like in my family to even graduate high school, to go to college. Like nobody in my family was even doing that. They were just like, you get a job, you, you know, you get a job and you provide for a family, you get a house, you have kids. And I'm like, no, that's not my fucking, <laughs> that's not really my move. Like, yeah. I don't know why in my head, like I never thought that way. I always thought bigger and more better than just being average and just being complacent. So for me, it's like with my business and my fighting or whatever I did, I always go outside the box. I don't just think- It's important to do that. Yeah, and that's the only way you're gonna be able to, to really take on those things and really take the risk. Because if you, don't, if you don't think that way, you're gonna be going to the comfort. You go right back to your comfort. Yeah. Which it's crazy, because for me, it's for fighting, so it's like, when I have struggles with my business and things that are going on, I'm ready to go back and fight again because that's my comfort. Like, that's what I know. That's what I do, right? So for me, like, fighting was my comfort zone. So for me, like, I'm trying to break that bond and be like, nah, you're not fighting no more, bro. You got to think about business. You got to think about real estate. You got to think about your brand. Like, you got to think outside of your normal comfort box, which for me was fighting. So... And just something where you just can't limit yourself. And like you said, I like the word you use, anchor, because a lot of people want to anchor themselves. I told Zach, no anchors. No anchors, I said, I'll make t-shirts for all Dude, summer. <laughs> no let's anchors. Fucking, let's go. Let's make those <laughs> I was shirts, like, man. tank tops, beach shit. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, board shorts. I was like, no fucking anchors. Because it's what they yeah. are. They're mental anchors that think that you have to do things. And, you know, it's it, it's it, it goes back to following people and keeping people around you. Even following people on social media. Like, yeah. like uh, you know, one shit. of my favorite things is how wild JM social media is. But it's just like, it makes you start thinking outside the box. It it's does. not something just telling you the same shit over and oh. over and over and over. Oh. I like what it makes you uncomfortable. Like he came down here and we were bullshitting and, and like 
it was crazy conversation, and I was smiling ear to ear. And yeah. I, I texted him the next day, and I was like, thanks for leveling the room out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, because there's a lot of times people are pushing shit on you or like, it's just a general safe conversation. Yeah. And then, you know, he, he sits down, opens a beer and he's like, you know, the earth's flat, right? <laughs> and I'm yep. like, yes. Going, yep, let's yes. fucking go and there. I'm looking at my friends who like the, like the couple people didn't know him and they're uh -huh. like, yeah. <laughs> so I texted him the JM, next day. I was right? like, dude, I was like, I, I can't wait to enter, you know, to talk to him. Like, uh, he's a That's special a, person, man. He, he does a lot of cool shit and I like, that he doesn't give a fuck and there's not a lot of people who don't give a fuck anymore that's um, the sad part like in the world we live in now i feel like that's something we lack it we, lost it's lost we, it's fucking it's, yeah. a lo it's like a lost <laughs> yeah. art yeah the last of the dying breed and uh that's why i like people like jam because yeah. they fucking tell it how it is and if he don't like it he don't give a fuck and for me i respect that because i feel like even me like i fall into that kind of like context of Oh, I got to watch out, protect my brand. I can't say this, especially like we were talking about earlier, like the whole political conversations and all that shit. I'm like, I don't even want to go there because yeah. I know when you're, I get you're a good follow though. I love all the boxing shit that you post. You post, you know why education, I love man. it, man. But I mean, there's some stuff that you showed in there. Um, that I like, I started paying attention to, especially a couple of the like it was like boxing instructors and shit, and I yeah. was like, yo, this is super interesting. Or because like I'll I'll put like the fire emoji on stuff, or like you'll you'll share like highlights of things and the boxing shit. But um, I don't know, man. But I, for me, it's like I do that now because I want to. All right, so this is where I'm like kind of branching off from my business because a lot of times I do that shit. It's because I'm like letting people know, like I'm gonna provide you with information that you need to understand and not just watching a video of somebody punching something yeah like i give you like a breakdown so for me it's like love it's like kind of separating to what i want to do which is for me now is creating content so i can provide those videos like those instructors yeah i want to start providing that type because we're in that social media world where people are on fucking line they don't want to go to the gym they don't want to meet with people they're so used to being in their fucking house or whatever it is. So for me now, I'm trying to branch off and cre create that content where I can provide and be that coach where I'm like, okay, well, we're going to go over this technique today and this is so-and-so and I break everything down because that's who I am. I'm an analytical person. I break every little thing down. I watch videos and I break them down to like a science. And for me, it's like I want to give those people – I want to give my clients and my you know followers – that type of content and information that they can really learn and develop something like a valuable skill set, not just, oh, I saw this guy get knocked the fuck out. It's like, no, there's a yeah, 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 there yeah. was a purpose and there was a I setup. love because I don't I don't get to see boxing a lot, you know? And I was like, I like boxing and I watch uh, the bigger fights when they're on, or like, you know, sometimes we'll put boxing on one TV and but fights on the other. But it's forgotten about. Yeah. Boxing's forgotten about. But I look but the stuff that you share is like like it's like technical, real. Like I was like, like you know, boxing. Yes. So like you're showing good boxing, and I'm like, I, I watch ninety percent of the shit that comes up, and I'm like, dude, that fucking. And then like, the, like the stuff where it's like slow mo, and somebody will yeah. break down like the, the fucking kidney shots and yes. stuff like that. But uh, hell yeah, I don't know, man. I'm I'm glad you came in. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for a while. We ran I've into been. each other a million times over at the school, hell and yeah. uh, I knew it was gonna go this way. But yeah, what I'm gonna have to do because uh, I want to get a couple of you guys back in here, and then just kind of do like uh, a group one again or maybe yeah. like you know that's what i'm saying with I hope. even the new studio like i hope we do a group one i want to sure, be able man. to like love to. i want to be able to do like a patreon or something where boxing's on you know we're probably not gonna be able to show that but like it'd be cool in the new studio to be able to like watch fights and not yeah. even just the ufc shit but be able to do uh like just random boxing stuff that you know maybe put people's eyes on what's going on um i want to give you a chance to um plug everything you're doing how anybody can get a hold of you for yeah. all the stuff that you said to offer uh, seriously thank you for coming on dude um, thank you so I had a much fucking for blast. me on man no, I, I, I hope you had a blast man dude there's, there's so many I don't many... want to be fucking boring talking no, about no not at all man shit, it wasn't you know a saying? boring story at all um, <laughs> usually when I you know reach out to people or people reach out to me I kind of figure out the story but I, I knew with the finisher stories there's always it's always how you got to finishers, and um, yeah. you know, everybody's got a rad story. I mean, when Renee came in, I didn't know his whole story, and then I was like, "Holy shit, man!" Like I you know. left college, and like yeah. he had put a lot of serious stuff on the uh, the plate for that show. So uh, I always appreciate you guys coming in and being honest. Thank you for the beer. Dude, uh, thank you for time. just being you. Um, I'm gonna give you a moment to kind of plug everything that you're doing and how people can get a hold of you. Yeah. So as I uh, 
finish up that good. That little, was really good. Huh? I'm, glad, I'm, glad you enjoy, I'm glad you enjoyed that strawberry milkshake, man. <laughs> Tired hands. Y'all do it right, man. Um, so, yeah. So, if you want to reach out to me, obviously, I have all the social media accounts. I have the Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, TikTok, all that stuff. But um, I'm mostly really big on the Instagram and the, the Facebook. So, if you want to follow me, rnuno1mma. Um, I actually, I actually have the acuity, uh, link that I probably, it's probably harder to say it on here because you can't really just look up acuity and then find me and then book the appointment. But if you were to look at a book and appointment, you can go on my Instagram account. So if you go to my Instagram at rnuno one MMA, you can see the acuity link and then you can schedule an appointment with me. So that's basically where you'll find me. You'll find me on Facebook. You'll find me on Instagram. You'll find me on Twitter. You'll find me on TikTok. Just look up rnuno one MMA. You're going to find me. But obviously the main thing is uh, the grit, wellness, and development. So I'm trying to get the right angle. But if you get that grit, wellness, and development, man, that's uh, that's the brand, man. That's the, the motto, man, grit. Where is your grit? Where's your toughness at? Where's that fighter in you? And where can we make you a better person overall with your, your health? your mental awareness, you know, just your physical ability to be a better person. That's what the brand is. It's not just because I'm here to hold mitts and have you punch things and feel tough. I'm here to develop an actual skill set and confidence and a healthier lifestyle. That's what grit, wellness, and development is all about. So, man, thank you so much for having me of on. Of course, dude. man. Dude, it was so Anytime, awesome, we'll, man. we'll do this again. I love doing this, man. Yeah, I love yeah, talking yeah. that yeah. shit, it's, it's, man. Uh, and... It's a blast. And um, like I said, I'll get a couple of the guys from over there. Um, and then there's still a bunch of people I want to get in here from finishers as well. But, uh, love you know, it's also them. like I didn't know you were doing all that. So that's dope that, uh, you know, now I can help you promote, um, you know, your brand and all that stuff. Appreciate so. you, man. Of course. Seriously, dude. It, Truly appreciate it, man. It if you're... Anytime, man. We'll definitely run it back. Um, if you're a first-time listener, first-time watcher, it is NeverAgainStudio.com. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube. We're building the YouTube up. We want to monetize off the YouTube, so we want to get all of our subscriptions up. I think we need a couple hundred more. Um, if you want to go to NeverAgainStudio.com, that has all the apparel. That has everything else on there as well. Uh, let me know if you need anything, if you want to sponsor the show, anything at all with stuff like that. Please contact me directly. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, I had a blast, man, and thank you for the beer. Dude, anytime. It was awesome being on. You the shit. Thank you so much, man. Yo, if you ain't watching this, you better start watching, man. It's a place to be, bro. <laughs> no one's ever done that. What a great ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dude. Anytime, that dude. That went fucking awesome. Dude. I believe it. Never again radio. Get into it, brother.